Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. Erin, do we have anyone left in the waiting room? Not at the moment. All right, and I guess we'll get started. You're not here to see me tonight, so I'll just hand everything over to Brad. Enjoy the next hour. Oh, come on, Jill, you're the heart and soul of this place. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, signing in, signing up, and joining me for another uh, Cocktails with the Curator. I'm looking forward to answering anybody's questions. So as soon as you wanna jump in, I'll be happy to, uh, to begin explaining as much as I possibly can. In the meantime, if you've not been to our facility, it really is a, a marvelous place to come visit. Next time you're in the Keys, if you're, if you're not local, please uh, drop in and see us. We do a ton of history. Uh, dating back well over a thousand years to the to the Aboriginal people, and then 1733 treasure fleets and pirates and wreckers and Flagler and the Overseas Highway. Just a really, it, this is a great place to come fish and come drink and come relax. But there's also a tremendous amount of history, and that's what we do here. We just try to do our best job of, of bringing all the great history to to you guys and to everybody else. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. Was that Rick? Was that you who suggested a top 10 list? Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Rick, go ahead and unmute yourself. There you How go. You? My pleasure. Good luck with your top 10 list. I've been thinking about it all day. I'm, uh, I'm probably going to uh, employ that for one of our uh, our uh, our Tuesday uh, Facebook Live things. That'll be a good that'll be a good list. Rick sent us a great email today. He visited the museum uh, over the weekend or last week, I think, mm -hmm. and, and really enjoyed it. And we, we loved his uh, thanks for reaching out to us and and and, uh, and, and connecting with us. And suggested I I go old school with some some David Letterman action and do a top ten list. So I've been compiling top 10 things that bug me about history and top 10 things about the top 10 historic places. I've got a couple of lists growing in my head for later on. Great. That was a really cool suggestion. So Rick, that was your first time to visit us? Uh, that was, uh, I couldn't believe how much stuff there was to look at. And uh, nice job keeping those fish tanks so clean, by the way. Well, fortunately, I can uh, I, I can hand that ball off to a moat marine biologist who was employed here to uh, to baby those reefs, uh, or those those aquariums, and all those fish. Because uh, I would kill the fish, Jill would kill the fish. I'm sure Aaron would kill the fish as well, and uh, they'd be all green and algae and and, and uh, not nearly as as well taken care of as they are. So, if you have a uh, wedding at at that facility, do you get free admission to the museum? I noticed that there would look like a reception hall, right? right next door there um it's people have not really free admission we, it, it's usually closed down um because the conference center is separate from the museum mm -hmm. but people have we have opened our doors for for several receptions and and other things that are held in the uh, conference room hey, people do hold uh hold um yeah. you know uh, welcome committees and other other things and we're, and we're always happy to uh yeah. to get our name out there as much as possible. And, and um, that's above my pay grade, and I don't handle any of that stuff. That's, that's Jill Miranda Baker's the, the big boss in that area. If I ever get married again, I'll, I'll probably come down and have some pictures taken in, your, uh, in, in, in some of those rooms that you've got so well done. Oh, cool. I'll, I'll put on my – I have a little rector's outfit that I, I wear sometimes. And so Excellent. I'll, I'll dress up as an 1830s, 1840s person for you. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Brad, we have a question from Chris Clark, who is our volunteer today. All right. He says a visitor today asked where funding for the railroad came from after Flagler ran out of money. Did it come from the state of Florida? Um, it was, I don't know. I, I was under the assumption that Flagler or the FEC or his ties to Standard Oil would have taken care of all, those, all that funding. Um, it was a, as far as I know, it was privately, it was Flagler 
and he had so, very deep. Brad, this I, I was chatting with Jill, with Chris a little bit about this um, when I saw her. It's actually coming out of the Flagler video that we uh, documentary that we show in the theater. Um, and there was another theater glitch today and it um, cut off, it said. And so the documentary was saying he ran out of money and the state of Florida and and then it, ah. um, and so that's what she was asking. What's the end? <laughs> I, Flagler, I must admit, Flagler and the railroad is probably not one of, not one of my strengths at all. Um, and I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I know Florida was bankrupt or not bankrupt at that point. Um, I'm not sure who put the money. That's something I'll, I'll have to look into. Thanks, Aaron, for that, that chiming in. Yeah, I had to, I had to give a presentation, um, a group called Road Scholars. Um, they usually come, it, it's a group that travels like a 10 day trip from, uh, starts in Miami, ends in Key West. And pre COVID, they would, you know, stop at all these places along, along the island chain. And I would come in and give them a, a you know, an hour tour and talk basic history. And I'm like, but this year being, being what it was, it was all virtual. And so last Monday I did a, a presentation on just general Florida Keys history. And then at the last <laughs> minute, their Flagler person backed out and I had to jump in and um, I did not, I, it was, it was a, a panic, a, a panic presentation for me, putting it together for an hour long talk about a subject I'm not, super super great with um but that's a great question that's something I'm, yeah that I, i'm interested to know that myself because chris, chris and i will uh, I, I will look into that <clears throat> yeah I, yeah toby i de definitely that that, that would be a, a, a an easy way to do it i'll try to every time somebody asks a question uh, <clears throat> toby just said why don't you call you I, I can call the the Feigler museum and she gave me the number but one of the things that is really cool about my job and, and what I do and, and with these kind, of, these kind of interactions is that when I get, you know, when people ask questions, I like to, you know, kind of look it up myself and figure it out because that just only helps to build my, my you know, breadth of, of knowledge about, about, the, about the history. And it allows me to, to learn more and become, you know, better balanced as a, a local historian. So I'm, I'm not going to take the easy way out yet. If, if I can't dig up the answer, that will be my plan C or D. But first I will, uh, I will do some reading and, and do some other things to, so I can learn. It, it's easier if I, if, if I learn myself. It, it, that, that way it's, it, it sticks in my brain better. All right. I just saw a chat, a question about Craig Key. Uh, where fun... Um, uh, Craig Key, what's with the old concrete building now a permanent fixture? On Craig Key, which is, which was, Craig Key was one of the islands that wasn't an island until Flagler came through. So it was largely built on fill. Um, and there are some buildings on that area that have, one's kind of, um, I don't want to say castle-like, yeah. but they're definitely, uh, there, there's been some, uh, concrete buildings out there that I've seen that, that have been there since I've been in the Keys. And um, they've just been empty. And I, I don't know, it, 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 it's privately, it, they're all privately owned. And so I'm not sure who owns it. Or, I know, I think one of them, uh, one, of the, one of the buildings has been, um, uh, has been recently or, or not recently, but it's been purchased and they're doing some renovations out there. But that's all private people spending their private money to do whatever their hearts and pocketbooks can uh, allow them to do. So I'm not, I'm not sure about what, the, what those buildings were. It just, some, I think someone's project that started and then ended. Welcome Mary Jo Kisco, who is a frequent, uh, a, a frequent visitor to our things here. See, here's a question. My in-laws will be spending their 30th anniversary in Key West in June. Are there any historically romantic places they might visit? Well, if they're visiting Key West, um, that's a good two hours from where we are. Um, and there's lots of really cool things to do in Key West. Um, as for romance in Key West, it's kind of cool to visit the Curry Mansion, which is a bed and breakfast now. And you can walk up to their old widow's walk. And it's really a breathtaking view. Um, and you have to, 
I'm, I think it's just for guests or if you know, know someone who knows the owners, um, had some, uh, uh, but it, it really is a, a really beautiful view of the island. Um, um, uh, um, I had, God, Louis's backyard, great place to go for a romantic dinner with a, a, a view out overlooking, out overlooking the ocean. Um, but I'm not sure about uh, a midnight stroll through down Fort Zachary Beach. That, that's, but you can't go at midnight because that's a state park and that's blocked off at midnight. But, um, How about a ghost tour? That could be romantic. Before I go ghost tour, the butterfly, the butterfly museum is awesome. And that's great to, uh, to go through. It's air conditioned. There's lots of beautiful birds and butterflies there that can, uh, that, that will sometimes land on you. And, and it's great just to, it's a, it's a, that's a great thing to do. I love going, going to do that with my wife. And ghost tours are, ghost tours are always fun. If, if you find uh, scary things romantic, maybe you get scared and your wife will hug on to you a little bit and hold your hand a little tighter. Nothing wrong with that. My good friend David Sloan does an amazing um, uh, tour at East, Martel, East Martello Tower all about Robert the Doll, or mostly about Robert the Doll. Not really a love story, but, uh, um, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, that would be a, that, that would be a, a um, if, if, if frights get you, get you going, that might be a good thing to do as well. Sunset, yes, romantic, watching the sunset, absolutely, always a beautiful thing to do. That's, that's up and down the Keys, not, not, just, uh, not, not just in Key West. The sunsets are great up and down the Florida Keys. Craig Key had some drug traffic involvement. I think at some point in time, all of the Florida Keys had some drug traffic involvement. Um, one of my favorite stories is uh, I was talking to an old smuggler and they said that Indian Key was used as a, as a conduit, that the smugglers would come up at night and then put the drugs in the big military era, 1840 era cisterns. And then the guys from the island could run out and, and pick them up pick them up on the island. I was, I was, that was, that was always kind of funny to hear, but um, yeah, there's drug traffic, drug trafficking in the Florida Keys um, go hand in hand. So I'm, I, I would be surprised if there's an, not, not an island, if there's not an island in the chain that does not have some kind of drug, drug and trafficking history assigned, assigned to it. Hey, Brad. Yes. Many years ago, off of Key Largo, my parents, my father, an avid, avid fisherman, were trolling for dolphin and, of course, found some square groupers. And a neighbor seems to think that they were stranded there. So he comes to their assistance. The only thing was my parents <clears throat> were sunbathing at the time. <laughs> Al fresco? Uh, Al fresco. And I, <laughs> the joke was always he would have been the most... Um, popular bartender in New Jersey uh, that he owned a tavern if had he uh, kept the square groupers <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah there was there was um uh some just washed up on the, like a couple of million dollars I think just washed up of, of, I think it was coke and coke and marijuana just washed up recently and it's still it still happens fairly you know not infrequently mm -hmm. And yes, yes, he would have been very popular a bartender in New Jersey with a, and with a great story to tell. Hopefully no pictures involved, but, but a great story. Absolutely. All right, so. Hey Brad, since, since we were talking about more recent smuggling um, in our more recent history with smuggling, historically, what are some of the other things that uh, the Keys are known for as a, a smuggling? Um, destination. I'm not clear on the question, Erin. So what else has been smuggled through the Keys other than drugs, historically? Like, tell us about rum runners, Brad. That's what I was trying to teach. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Prohibition. Um, but the, the Bahamas were uh, very close. Cuba and the Bahamas, very close offshore with lots of rum and other, other things. And the ships used to Get to the state, you know, get to the uh, international waters, so they couldn't. As long as they were in international waters, they, they were fine. And there would be, you know, big ships out there having parties, selling selling drugs, 
and, or selling selling booze, and the uh, and 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 the skiffs and people in the Keys and in Miami and other places could run out, run out to the uh, to the territorial water to, to the territorial waters, and fill up their their skiffs or, or their boats with with booze and, and make a run back for either the mainland or the um or the uh, or you know the, the Keys. I know um, Captain Bill Smith was one of the local uh, fishing legends. He was the first person in 1939 to catch a bonefish on fly. And he um, also uh, survived the 1935 Labor Day hurricane on a quarter boat down on, um, down on Lower Matacumbi Key. But as a kid, they had a property up, up, um, up, up on the mainland. And he, he would tell stories about all the cases of booze coming in, in through prohibition and like, like a, just coming across his, his in their in their families under their families uh, docks and in through their house there was always trucks on his property you know getting loaded up with with, with booze and then they would you know and they would uh, you know make their way off and then because you know it seems to me that I have a hard time getting through any of these without bringing up the butters but there's a great uh, there's a great story from Ed and Fern Butters when they had their place on uh, North Key Largo in 19 19- they opened it up in 1926, and um, at one point, uh, uh, Fern and her husband were out in front of, of their little hotel, their little motel, and they had, they had some some uh, gas, not a gas station, but they also had some um, uh, 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 well, a, a gas station basically, an old old time gas station. But this roaster pulls up one day, and it was with um, Al Capone is is in the car with a couple of his 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 men. And one of the uh, men came up or, and asked, you know, asked uh, Ed Butters um, if they could use his dock to bring, to bring booze in. He would give them 25 bucks a load, which, is probably, which was good money back in, in the 1920s. And um, Ed Butters, who was not a get, Fern was not a drinker, but Ed was a drinker and had his own still on the other side of the road of, from, from the hotel, but uh, he told told uh, Al Capone, no, that you're not, I, I'm not going to give you access to my, uh, my property or, or my dock. And Fern said that that was, she thought that that was, you know, the last time she's ever going to see her husband alive because the guy with, with, with Capone, according to Fern Butters, was like, no one says no to, to Al Capone. Don't you know who you're talking to? No one tells him no. But uh, Ed said no, turned his back, walked away, and um, that was the last that they dealt with uh, Mr. Capone, who would be short-lived in his Miami home before uh, coming down with uh, syphilis, some disease, and then uh, it's syphilis, and then, and, and then going to jail. I know there are stories about, um, about the, uh, Ziggy's Old Conk, the, the restaurant on, on Upper Matacumbi Key, that Capone, there are stories that, 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 that Capone was there, you know, gambling in the back room once upon a time. But by the time that place was operational, way back when, he was either dead or, um, or, or uh, with the syphilis and, 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 and gone. And he was apparently was, was um, kind of childlike at that point due to the, due to the disease and, and, and how it you know, had affected his body and his mind. So probably not a an easy mark if you're playing if you're playing uh, poker with someone who who uh, who can't think for himself too much anymore. Probably a, an easy mark, but then again, you probably wouldn't want to go against Al Capone in any case because he had many friends. Oh, and by the way, happy uh, happy Cinco de Mayo! As you can see, I'm not drinking tequila. I do have a Dominican beer, not not technically a Mexican beer, but it's at least it's uh, in the in the ballpark of 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 of, uh, of Spanish speakers. So, cheers to I know someone uh, Rick's drinking wine. I see that, and uh, I'm yeah. not seeing anybody else raise a glass yet. All right, Don's got coffee. Uh, George has got coffee or tea or something along those lines. Yeah, there, the question is: There's a restaurant open now with Ziggy in its name. Is that a historic reference? Yes, it's now. Um, it was called Ziggy's Conk back, you know, 
back when Ziggy, um, who who was the original owner, he had 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 a place in Marathon before he moved up to um, up to uh, up to uh, uh, Upper Matacumbi Key. And and this is the Ziggy who um, there's a, a reference to Ziggy in uh, the movie Key Largo with Humphrey Bogart, and this is supposedly, supposedly named after this particular Ziggy, and um, so the, the current owners, um, well, it was it was a uh, uh, Mad Dog Mandich who was part of the '72 Dolphins who were undefeated, and he um, bought the he bought that 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 restaurant. Um, after I moved down here, because I worked, I worked at that place before Mad Dog owned it. That was my first, my first came to the Keys in 2001. I worked there briefly, um, and then it was bought by Mad Dog and, and, and named Ziggy and Mad Dogs. So that's definitely a reference to, to the Ziggy of old. I remember um, when George Hummel, who was a frequent visitor at uh, at Lazy Days Restaurant, where I, I I waited tables for ten years before I came here, and um and started this did this part of my life, but um, but George would always say he loved Ziggy's because no matter what time of year it was, he always had some stone crab claws in the back for George whenever uh, he and Doris would go in there for dinner. Hey Brad. Yes. I remember asking you a while back about a building that's. The what they call the clubhouse at the Harbridge, which is what 97, two, three, Oceanside. There was the quote unquote what they call the clubhouse. Um, I had heard was a Coast Guard lookout station that had been built there before the Harbridge was developed. And I know that I had seen it in some paperwork from one of the um people who live there, but unfortunately she's passed. Had you ever been able to come up with anything on that? And I haven't, and it's interesting, there was a, I was contacted by another guy, or a, by a guy um, last several months, who was asking a similar question, but about a CIA, a CIA operation um, up in Northern Key Largo. And um, he was trying to verify that there was a CIA, like a black, Black Ops CIA operation going on up there. Um, Coast Guard, probably, I, I have not, I, I've not come across anything. I've, 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 not, I've not seen anything. Um, I haven't looked into it tremendously because we've been, okay. we've been, uh, I've been trying to do, the, do, do programs. Um, but I, I know the Coast Guard, I, I know um, uh, during World War II in the 1940s, um, there was a lot of, of, of activity in the area. I know um, a couple of, um, there was a great interview with, I'm gonna botch the names here, with um, Joanne and her brother, Aaron, if you can help me out, if you, if you have near hotel. Are you talking about the McKenzie's? Yes, thank you, the McKenzie's. Um, as, as kids, they, during during um, during World War II, they would hear the Mackenzies were a family that came down in the 1920s. They uh, they did a lot of construction work. And Toby, can you not hear? Toby, can you can you hear us? All right, she was holding her hand up to her ear. But um, they would talk about hearing explosions out on the out on the ocean at night, and then they would walk the walk the you know, from because there were a lot of submarines going back and forth and, uh, and other things happening out during the uh, world war ii and they would patrol they, they would walk the coastline the next day and to see what what had washed up and there was a great image of um one of those old-fashioned landmines with all the all the oh, cool. little things sticking out that, that had washed up um on the shore in tavernier so the, and there was also um george I can't believe I can't remember his last name. But also in Tavernier, they had kind of like a a local a lookout station that mm -hmm. people would volunteer and um, to to look out at the, you know at the water to make sure to to spot something. So there was a, there was a lot of activity in the area um, in that time, and 
and the Coast Guard definitely would have been involved because they, they had been operating the uh, lighthouses at that point as well in, in, the, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, but I, I have not come across anything, and that's one of those things that it'll, I'll be going through something one day, and it's going to pop up, and um, hope, hopefully that's how it happens. That's how it usually happens. I'll, I'll be looking for something else, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see a reference that someone asked, and then I, I go down a rabbit hole for, for different reasons, and then I don't get anything done <laughs> as I'm looking for other materials. But it's, that's, that's one of those things in the back of my head, that, and, and, and um, so when it comes up, Mary Jo, I know you're always around. And I will, uh, not always around, but you know, you're a, 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 frequent, a frequent visitor with us. And so one day we'll get that mystery solved. Hopefully. All right. I know there is, there's so much. All right. Toby, is your audio back on? All right. Yeah. Excellent. I know there's always so much more history than you think there's going to be it's whenever i start whenever i do one of these presentations like come um, uh, our next presentation um for community like we, we we alternate every month between um cocktails with the curator and, and then a community's views where i kind of highlight the history of of one of the communities or, or one of the local islands and um whenever i do one of these it's always kind of like a deep dive into some of the old pictures that we have and, and then looking for information and kind of watch, watching the, the onion kind of unravel as, as I spend, you know, I'll, I'll spend the next four weeks kind of digging into um, to pictures that I've seen for a long, you know, seen for years or things that I've, 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 I've known like two sentences worth of material about, but then I start looking deeper into, um, a, a perfect example is um, my column that came out, that comes out tomorrow uh, it's about the overseas highway, and for years, you know, I, I've I've heard about this politician named named George. In eighteen ninety five, he George. I can't think of his last name. Um, though I just wrote a a bunch about him last week, um, but he was one of the very first people to advocate for a roadway to link. Key Largo and the mainland. But this is 1895, dating back to 1895. And then as I'm, but I've always wondered who, what that, you know, who that man was. So I, you know, it, so I, I, I did more research in, into that man and it turns out he was a, 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 um, a Florida state senator. Um, he lived in Key West, was a Florida state senator. Um, ended up becoming the first president of the Key West National Bank. So that there, that big, uh, there, there's a big prominent building at the end of Duval Street that was the, the very first uh, Key West National Bank. Um, so he had a, a really great history. And sadly, he died in 1922 before, uh, before the first link, uh, the first conduit that, um, that connected the mainland to Largo, which was the Card Sound Bridge opened up in 1926. So he, while he was probably the first one um, to, to talk about a road to connect the, the mainland to the Keys, he never actually saw it come to fruition. Although he was not the last person to make that comment. I know in 1919, the, the Miami Motor, Motor Club uh, also began to lobby for a road to link the, uh, the Keys and Key Largo specifically to the mainland because they wanted to offer their their uh, their get or their um, their, uh, their their guests or whatever um, a suburban fishing ground in the Florida Keys, which is why one of the very first names for the overseas highway, which was called State Road 4A, was off, was also known as the fishing route, mm -hmm. which is and of course and and other members you know it, it's known other names but. But um, that was a uh, that was just kind of an example of how one idea begins to kind of blossom and and, and grow, and then um, it leads to a whole different a whole different um, you know vein of history that I was unaware of or or un, unfamiliar with, and um, which, which is why I kind of like uh, you know digging into these these presentations because it really you know puts me on a on a time schedule where I have to get, you know, get my, my stuff together 
and uh, so I can so I can you know sit down here and, and and tell tell my stories or tell the stories and um so it's really valuable it's really a valuable tool uh once the pandemic came when we had to switch from you know uh, our, our old format to doing all, all these virtual presentations and reaching out to the community because the community couldn't come to us um it really helped me to you know kind of zero in on on lots of local history and 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 really bring it up you know and and, and get more comf comfortable with it myself is there much sorry, I can film for them shot from trainer to tell uh, the, the question is is there much surviving film footage around shot from train as it's headed south would love to see it um we do have some of it on rick did you see that that's from rick who was here we have on in our um there is some great footage that we were able to um uh that was we were able, we're able to use and there's some great there's some great uh, you know footage in the documentary that we show about henry flagler's the building of Henry Fowler's Railroad in, in our in our theater, but we also have in our um, our exhibits of uh, uh, Florida stories of the Florida Keys, um, in that there which is you know seven panels all talking about um, some of the different some of the different uh, communities and, and how things started, and we do have a great uh, a great silent um, uh, shot of. Um, of some of the uh, the workers building bu building the, the highway, or building the the railroad, and it had, does have some um, some shots of, of the train um, moving south or north. I'm not sure which which direction. Actually, east and west, basically. But I'm not sure exactly which one, uh, how much is on there. But there is some, and um, and there there are others that we don't have access to that we don't have the ability to show here. Uh, but there are some other some other documents or, or some other um, films, old films that, that I see. There's also a great, uh, a great um, uh, advertisement for, Chev for Chevrolet cars from 1934 or 35 that um, it's, it, the, it's, it's, it's pre Labor Day hurricane. So it shows, it's a, it, it, it's a, it, it's a commercial for Chevrolet cars and how, how good they are going over the tracks but there's also some um, some shots of the train barreling down the tracks as well. And we used to have that playing in the theater. I'm not sure if it's playing there anymore. My internet connection is unstable. Uh, looks like it's back. Or is everyone frozen? Somebody move. <clears throat> hey, Brad, I've got a question. All right, I'm the only one moving. All right, uh, Brad. My uh, question, as a historian of the Keys, um, what is the um, the um, the part of um, Keys history that most fascinates you? And then my second question is, um, what um, <clears throat> recent discovery have you made that um, is pretty fascinating? So, your overall most fascinating part of the history of the Keys, and then what what something recently that you discovered that that is pretty cool. Your, your audio is out. How about now? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah, apparently we're having some uh, some internet difficulties here. Um, what's, it's always surprising. Hmm. Some of my favorite historical things that I've learned, not discovered, um, discovered for myself, but um, I don't think I've uh, I've made any great you know great personal discoveries in, in, that you know mostly just learning things that right. maybe have been tucked away since the 20s or the 1800s. One of the, one of the great things that I learned last year about was about the attack on Indian Key and who Chikeka, the Indian chief that attacked Indian Key, was, and learning. And, and, and learning about that history. There's so much bad history, misinformation that is, that is talked about and given and repeated over and over and over that is really, you know, and that's part of my job is trying, not, is trying to fight that and, and 
and trying to correct, you know, the a general uh, general appearance of, of knowledge. Um, a great example of that is the, the whole Purple Isles, uh, that Alamrata are, are the Purple Isles, which is really ingrained in in the local history and and the local legend, not really history, the local legends, and still. Um, when they, even though we, you know, still when they um, promote this area, they talk about, you know, come to Alamrata, the Purple Isles, which is just a complete, a, a complete, you know, miss them. It's a, a complete, you know, uh, legend, lore, local legend, local lore that, that, um, that is uh, been debunked time and time again. And one of the great things I rem that I was um, happy about or happy with this happened years ago was that the Alamrata Chamber of Commerce finally changed their their web page and started, you know, not talking, not advertising the Purple Isles, but 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 talking about the real uh, name place name of, of Alamrata, which was done, which which was named by uh, by, by William J. Crome circa 1906. The great, you know, they talk about how um, you know how the Spanish conquistadors named these the Purple Isles because of the purple water or the purple bougainvillea or, or the purple sea shells that, that are sea snails that washed up. Um, but what's, what's really interesting is that, you know, Matacumbi, which is, you know, the, the heart of Isla Mirada, let's just concentrate on upper Matacumbi, is one of the oldest place names in all of South Florida, dating back to the, the 16th century. And there, and, and on many, many Spanish maps, all the Spanish maps and charts, you know, always refer to this island and lower Matacumbi by some variation of the name Matacumbi. So when people, you know, say, oh, these are the Purple Isles, you know, the Spanish conquistadors named them that, my, you know, great response is, show me one map, show me one, you know, document that has, that mentions anything about, about Murata or Murado or Purple Isles or anything. And, you know, I'll, I will, I will, uh, you know, believe you, but that's, but it, it just doesn't happen because Alamrata didn't exist at the place name until 1906. And it was named after, after um, William Crome, who, who ended up being uh, Flagler's lead engineer um, or head en engineer towards the end there um, of, of the construction was the one who, who uh, named it Alamrata after, you know, and, and named it Alamrata meaning island home probably after the, the, um, the schooner island home that was constructed on Plantation Key in 1902. And because um, in my opinion, because, um, because uh, Chrome, and this is just me, you know, kind of taking the information and putting one and one together and trying to get two and hopefully not helping to create more of this information, but that Chrome realized uh, the, the change that was coming with, with the entry of Flagler's Railroad and how this, these islands were going to change from a boat culture to a train culture and, and then, you know, uh, and then, a, um, and then a, uh, a, a, a car culture after that, um, that it was maybe his nod to uh, the change that was coming ahead because he would have known about the ship Island Home, which was how people in this area, you know, when they wanted mail or friends or, or things that, that that ship traveled between Miami and, and Key West because prior to Flagler coming, that was the only way that you got in and out of the Keys. And that was the, you know, and that was not always reliable transport um, depending on weather and other, other things. Uh, but that was, those two are, are ones that come up immediately. Um, It seems like recently I, I figured something out, but I can't think of what it is right now. Let me ponder that for a minute or two. And um, all right, I lost my chat. Let me look at my chat and see if there's anybody asking questions. So Brad, one question that was typed in, do you have information about the story of the toll gate in Lower Matacumbi? That I do, yeah. Um, so the toll gate, after 1935 Labor Day hurricane struck, um, that was the end of the Overseas Railroad. That was the end of Flatters Railroad. 
And prior to 1934, that was, was when in November 1934 was when the first veterans came down to this area because they were trying to build a set of solid, solid bridges that would have paralleled the, the railroad tracks because when the Overseas Highway first opened in 1928, there was a 40 mile gap in the highway between, between Lower Matacombe Key and No Name Key. And that gap was, uh, was um, you, you, went, you got through that gap by, by putting your car on an automobile ferry. Those automobile ferries were not super reliable and they wanted to get a, set, a, a solid bridge system to eradicate the need for those, those automobile ferries. And uh, so they were, built, they were in the midst of building these solid bridge systems. 1935 hurricane comes and Riders Railroad is devastated. 40 miles of, of track are washed away. And, th and this is a Great Depression. So Monroe County is bankrupt. Florida is bankrupt. Riders Railroad is near bankrupt. The, the Key West extension of it is. And when they went to uh, rebuild the, the highway, they used a lot of the old railroad bridges, which, survived, which were really well, uh, well built. And, and they um, widened them to accommodate automobile traffic. But to pay for all the work, there, the Overseas Highway became a toll road. When the highway opened, reopened in 1938, uh, there, it was now a toll road, and there was a toll booth on Lower Matacombe Key, which is why there was a, an old hotel there called, that became known, or a restaurant hotel, that became known as a toll gate inn. And the second, and the second uh, toll booth was uh, on Big Pine Key. And that, that, those toll roads uh, operated between 1938 and 1954, when the tolls were lifted, the um, toll booths were carted off and the state of Florida wanted to rename the overseas highway, the Florida Freeway, because it was now free. But the locals did not want to take part of that. They liked their overseas highway. So they uh, sent a, pet a petition around and, and got the name reinstated as the overseas highway. So that was the um, kind of the short version of uh, of why the, the toll gates were were put in, and they were basically put in where the uh, ferry terminals for the automobile ferry had been, uh, one on Lower Matacombe Key, which is where you picked up the automobile ferry, and in those days that the automobile ferry went to No Name Key, and then you would have to there. There's a good picture, and that's yeah. that's the one on uh, that's the one on uh, on Lower Matacombe Key, and the and the toll gate in which had previously been called the Ferry Slip Cafe, um, had been instituted. And tolls weren't cheap for 1938. They were a, a buck, uh, a, a buck a person, a buck for the car, plus a quarter for every person. And in 1938, that, that dollar charge would have been around 17, 18 bucks according, compared to today's money. Mm. So it wasn't a, wasn't a cheap way to travel. And the automobile ferry even was 350 per car so that was it was it's cheaper to drive but that was a lot of money back in the 1920s and 1930s if you wanted wanted to travel either to key west or from key west up 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 through the florida keys to the mainland and rick is asking are, are my columns are my stories keys weekly regular column or do they appear randomly um they appear every week in all three versions of the Florida uh, of the Keys Weekly, um, they have three editions. They have an upper key, the marathon, and a uh, Key West version. And my column is 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 one that appears in all three every week, which also helps me to stay focused on on the history and and to uh, to keep learning more. Although I can't, I still can't remember George politician's last name who first who talked about getting a. Uh, a road in 1895. It's going to come to me as soon as I hang up, or as soon as we end this, it's going to come to me. George. Hey, Brad. Yes. How long was the Tavernier Airport um, in use? I mean, is it, I see, is there still some private little planes that? Yeah, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's a community called Taveniero, and it is, um, it's a private, 
it's a, it's a not really an airport. It's a it's a private uh, yeah. strip. Yeah. And people who live there all have their planes in the, like kind of their garages. I and it's I um one. it's a gated community. There on, on Tavernier, which is a community of on on a plantation. Uh, this part of it's on Plantation Key. And it is a uh, it, it's a um it's which is just on this on the south south side of uh, the Tavernier Tavernier Creek. It is an airport community. Um, there's you know lots of places, lots of local communities have have boats and, and marinas and docks. This one happens to have a, a landing strip. And when those and when those planes come in, the first time I saw I, I used to ride across the the highway from that area. And you think those planes are going to crash into the trees, and um, and uh, it's it's the first time, first couple of times you see them, it's like what's going on, but um, that's a private community, and it's um, and if you know someone, you know, I, I think you can land there if you know somebody. So that's you know, kind of goes with, with, a lot of things about who you know. Wasn't there also an airstrip in Key Largo, Oceanside, that was allowed to be converted? There was. To, yeah, I guess there's houses there now, but it's one of the few areas because I thought like cemeteries and and airport or airstrips are sort of one of the things that are very difficult to get a redes redesignated to some to like residential property or something. Yeah, there there was one on on Lower Matacumbi Key, an airstrip. There was, and, and the one you're talking about is around mile marker 100. I think uh, I think um, Port Largo is the community where it is now. And the old landing strip is, this is on the ocean side, the old landing strip is now kind of like the, um, um, the, uh, oh, the breaker for the, uh, for the water. But that's, but when you look at it, like, like, like the aerial view, it's long and narrow and, and it was once where, uh, where um, airplanes landed. But it's Port Largo at mile mark 100 is where that, that one is. And maybe was. I can ask um, more about the Tavernero community because that land was originally a part of the um, Albury homestead and it's actually where my great grandfather's um, one of the locations where he had his key lime plantations and they sold those off you know sold parcels off as they needed money to pay for doctors and things like that so I'll have to ask my grandfather if he knows if it was sold directly to developers to become an, you know, a, an airstrip community or if that came later on in the history of the property. So I'll ask and see, see if anybody remembers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Another reason why we love having Erin with us. <laughs> She's amazing. Because yeah, because she uh, is sixth, seventh generation with an eighth on the way or a seventh generation, sixth with a seventh on the way. Sixth with a seventh but, uh, on the way. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, she's a she's a, a great asset to us here, and we love having her here. And it's always nice when she um can dig in for an old picture and share those with us as well when we're doing these. And she's I great have at, at I have some video pulled up, Brad, um, of the train. I found it in our um, archives. Oh, cool! Would you like me to show you at that point, or if you want to go to Rick's question first about Long Key. And the lock. stayed in Long Key. Uh, Leighton, certain nuggets of date before the famous fishing lodge. Well, that was, um, you know, Long Key before, before, uh, before Flagler wasn't, there wasn't a lot there. There was, um, and so I, kind of the, the start of Long Key in that, in that area, um, and, and the, and the Long Key fishing camp was, it was a former uh, work camp for Flagler's Railroad. And in 1909, 1910, it began to transform into the, the, the Long Key Fishing Camp. I believe Zhang Gray was the first came down in 19, 1909 and 1910. He and his brother had planned to go to Mexico to go tarpon, tarpon fishing, but there was a pandemic, probably cholera, um, in Mexico at the time, they couldn't go there. So they decided to come down to Long Key. They had heard about the great fishing there. But prior to prior to that, there wasn't a ton going on. And then Del Layton, um, who was the namesake of, of Layton, he was, you know, kind of be, beyond that as well. It was, you know, uh, 40s, 50s. 
because that area was, you know, after 35, that whole area was like, because the eye of the hurricane 1935 passed over lower Matacumbi and Long Key. So that area was really devastated. Um, there wasn't much there prior to 1935, except for the, the fishing camp. And then at, that I, to the best of my knowledge right now, um, and then it took a couple years for things to kind of develop afterwards. Um, why don't you, that, that um, Aaron, why don't you go ahead and play that because that, that is silent. I believe it's a silent, uh, a silent film of the, of, of the railroad uh, train. Okie dokie. Cool. And again, another great reason to have, we really <laughs> love having Aaron here because he's, so I, I, it is a six minute clip. I queued it up to a particular spot that have, has some footage of oh, cool. the train. So yeah, this is, we were Wolfson archives. They were super generous with us and, and allowed us to use, to, to use it, this footage. And this is of course the Bayou Honda bridge, which is the only bridge like this in the, uh, and that's, this is channel five. And all those tracks after the hurricane were just ripped off. Those, um, the bridges were good, but all the tracks were disappeared, were blown off after the 1935 hurricane. But those, but Flagler did, had done an amazing job, or his men, of building these super, these super uh, solid bridges that have really withstood the uh, test of time, although some of them are pretty bad shape. Here we are on Pigeon Key. Um, and that's, this is one of the bridges known as a seven mile, kind of a seven mile bridge area now. Cow. Probably on, this is Pigeon Key as well, which became not only the, uh, during, and this is, uh, school, ch school children on Pigeon Key in the, um, early 19, 1900s. And this is, I think the, the Vaca, uh, the, uh, the viaduct. There were two kinds of, and this is um, this is the this is the bridge that gets blown up in True Lives, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. This was the sing, the swing bridge on um on the uh, it, it was the Moser Channel Bridge. The seven mile bridge was actually four separate bridges that were um, kind of pieced together, and this section is called the Moser Channel Bridge. And uh, before it was arched, most, there were no like, um, and that, yeah, that's, yeah, there, there, were, there were no like, um, all, the, all the bridges were swing bridges. So if you were a, a bridge tender back in those days, like at Jewfish Creek or Snake Creek or wherever, when the, when the um, boat had to come out, you had to go out there and crank that bridge open and then let, let the boat pass and then crank that bridge closed again which I always think is, would be, you know, if, if, if your job as bridge tender is that hours and hours of, of doing nothing and then, and then uh, you know, half an hour of just chaotic, chaotic hard labor. Thanks for bringing those up, Aaron. That, that, that was cool. And Rick, okay. if, you hadn't, if you hadn't caught those when you visited, that was the, that was the, the, uh, the bit I was, I was speaking about exactly. Well, we're getting close to seven o'clock. Does anybody uh, anybody have any more questions before we start to wrap this up? Ellen just joined us. She must have a question. Ellen, I know you have a question. All right. <laughs> sorry, sorry, we joined late. Um, Brad, weird. when you were at the quarry the other day. Uh, the machinery was was that all run by steam power? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, There's my um, question. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I, I got it today. <laughs> so, Brad, for the folks who didn't see our field trip yesterday, can you give us some some context to that answer? Oh, come on! Everyone's. We're reading minds here. So on, 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 on Tuesday, we do a Facebook Live uh, post a, a, every Tuesday. And uh, so last Tuesday, we went to the Windley Key Fossil Coral Reef State Park, which is a great place to go because um, not only is it a former quarry, 
that was used during construction of Henry Flagler's Railroad, but also um, uh, for other, uh, other means, it operated until 1968, which we learned on our trip, Aaron and I did. Um, but they have, um, what's great about this park is that because it's a quarry, there are eight foot tall um, exposed limestone walls. And you're able to see all of these, all of the fossilized corals because 100,000 years ago, all these Florida Keys were once a thriving coral reef. And then um, as you know, water moved up and down, these became land, then they became the Florida Keys. But um, it's a great place to really see, because uh, you can look at the walls and, and see all the fossilized corals in the walls. But they also, at, at, it's, a, it's a, another great state park, but it has um, a lot of, or, or some of the old machinery is still there. And we were looking at, so it's, it, it, it's kind of a great place to kind of get a feel on how they used to quarry these, these um, the limestone. And what's interesting is that across the street is Theater of the Sea, which opened like in 1946, 1947. And their water feature there, uh, where the dolphins perform, is another former quarry. In fact, in the parking lot area, in, during construction of uh, Flagler's Railroad, 1910, 1909-1910 time frame, that parking lot area was known as, was a town site, a, a, railroad, a railroad town site named Quarry, which was a really popular, um, uh, as, far, it, it, as far as railroad camps uh, go, they uh, talked about how good the food was there. Um, but it's uh, that was, that's kind of a little background what we're going what we're talking about there. We you know talked about a lot of those topics during our um, during our our Facebook uh, uh, Discover History feature on Facebook on Tuesday every Tuesday at ten o'clock, and those can all be found if you go to our um, our, our YouTube page, uh, which is the Florida Keys History and Discovery um, Center. We have all of those. Um, are available there to to view, which is a and we've been doing this for a year now, so there are a ton of them, and we uh, we, we talk a lot about the about the exhibits, about the history, and then sometimes we actually go on field trips and go to different places around the Upper Keys, primarily because that's where we are. Um, it'd be cool if we could travel farther down down the Keys, but that's just not you know something we can do time time wise. We, Every one of these productions take all three of us to do, um, which which is uh, which, which is just how, how that stuff works. But um, go visit our uh, visit our um, our uh, our uh, our YouTube page. All these are all the cocktails of the curator former ones are, are, are there as well, and just some great some great things are on that as well. So it is seven o'clock. If anybody has a last minute uh, question, we'd be happy to. To try to answer. Otherwise, I believe it's time to uh, to sign off for now. Although we're going to do an, an, another one of these next month with um, a guest, will be Corey Convertito, who is the curator down at the Key West Art and Historical Society, and um, that's going to be a great. She, she's always great and has lots of information on, on tourism and cigar industry and um, her specialty is uh, maritime history. So if you have any maritime questions. <laughs> She is a PhD in British naval history and can tell you all about uh, Key West from a naval standpoint back in those days as well. Brad, I have a quick question. Yes, Don. What year was the water pipe installed from the mainland down to Key West? That was part of the third version of the Overseas Highway. So 1943, 1944, because the, um, the, the, uh, the government needed to get all their heavy equipment and, and need water down for the for the military down in Key West, and so they needed to uh, to uh, to redo some of the bridges that were fine for cars, but not so uh, supportive of some of the heavy equipment that, that needed to be uh, to gone down to Key West. But part of the part of that um, of, of that reconstruction, and that is when the 18 mile stretch is incorporated in, into the overseas highway. But part of that deal was they would um, bring the the water pipeline from uh, from from Homestead from the mainland all the way down all the way down to Key West. Okay, and do you know what year the uh, electric lines were installed? Those are more piecemeal. Um, so there was a lot of a little bit here, a little bit there. 
before things really began to, you know, to come together. So that was like an early 1930s is when it started. Uh, but I don't know the exact date of, of when like there was a, a continuous uh, electricity from, you know, all up and down the Keys. Cause it was, there was a little bit in Tavernier, a little bit in, in Alamorada, a little bit in Marathon. Um, it started much earlier down in Key West because that was a, you know, the, the largest, excuse me, largest community. But that's, that's more of a piecemeal thing where the water pipeline was a, you know, one time, boom, there it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you again next month. Um, and then uh, in the meantime, check us out on Tuesdays and just, just keep supporting us because we love having you, having you support what we're doing. It's important. We love doing it and we're happy to be here for you and we're happy that you're here for us.